Hey class. Uh, so I wasn't able to come up with anything more interesting than continuing our topic from Tuesday. So uh, while you continue to uh, to labor away uh, uh, on your exams, um, I thought we would just lecture, uh, uh, talk about science and uh, computer science for the fun of it. So uh, okay, so we have this problem. We have the system, the the universe at whatever scale you want to discuss it, right? At the the macroscopic or the microscopic scale. Uh, and um, we would like uh, for some, some future use of technology to be able to describe this and then to be able to model it uh, computationally uh, as accurately as we want. Um, and so uh, in order to get to that point, we have to be able to represent it via code. And we have to have some understanding. So uh, we're, we're speaking uh, through the, the lens of conjecture, but this is also where advancement happens, right? When you have the freedom to think um, just something different uh, that uh, may or may not be more accurate. Right? We, we kind of talked about that a little bit last time. Um, so uh, we have this concept of sea level. We have this concept of a, a fourth spatial dimension and a, this uh, four-dimensional sphere. Um, and then uh, the, the pug wrinkles, right? So the, the surface area uh, may play a role in uh, in defining the behavior, and we'll discuss that as well. Um, but mostly, if uh, if we're going uh, if we're going to look at it seriously through any lens, right? Whether it's this one or, or some other future model that we find, uh, if we believe that to be more accurate, uh, then you have to find some way to start discussing it, right? And so, as we were going through the notes this semester, I, I tried to highlight the fact that. Uh, there were essentially two types of information that we were trying to take in from the notes. Uh, so if you set aside the, the programs, right, like all of the coding examples, uh, then there were definitions and theorems. Uh, and so uh, the definitions was whenever we were just agreeing on a way to discuss a particular problem or a particular topic or a particular idea. Uh, and then uh, the theorems were uh, the, <laughs> the non-trivial results whenever you, uh, you start considering um, specific cases or uh, restrictions whenever you have a list of assumptions that uh, when you can guarantee these assumptions and I can guarantee you that this result holds. Right? Uh, so uh, to generate the definitions, right, whenever you're coming up with something new, um, it begins from the discussion of the problem, right? So now we have this idea that we want to represent. We'd like to be able to represent it uh, via code. Uh, and we have some concepts that we've discussed, and so those those concepts, those ideas, whatever uh, whatever mnemonic we use to <laughs> to keep a reference and understanding in our mind, that ends up becoming the definition. Uh, so we talked about sea level, right? Because whenever we were discussing maps and atlases, which are, are themselves in a, uh, you know uh, just a, another way of modeling these concepts of of breaking it up into these local approximations that are. Uh, pretty good, and they allow you to speak of it everywhere. Uh, and so, um, all right, so we just generate more of these as we go along, and we agree to keep referring back to the same thing as the same thing. And if you do it often enough, and if some theorem results from it, then it ends up becoming a definition, right? Uh, and so then the theorems are, are just the ideas that uh, you end up being able to prove rigorous results about. So you carry on long enough, and then you're able to make some prediction, and in the world of physics, uh, once you do that, uh, then um, you know <laughs> you could test it, presumably, right? <laughs> so, uh, so if it holds up to testing, then uh, then there's some uh, evidence to to your model, right? Uh, and so <laughs> we're going to claim uh, a little bit of luck here and you know uh, seize on it, uh, in that there is already you know this this uh, contradictory evidence, right? That we have. Uh, it, we previously had uh, no real understanding of what uh, the perceived uh, expansion uh, of the universe, the, the Doppler effect that we were seeing in terms of, of light, uh, other than they were moving away. But now we have this alternative view in which uh, the light um, plays a role in doing gravitational work uh, and it, it sort of tightens everything together. The, where there's more light, there's there's more gravitational work being done, and so uh, it bunches up the galaxies and, and so forth, right? So now we have this alternative view, 
Uh, and so they're, you know, in a way, the, the tests have already been done for us. So, um, so let's speculate further, right? Uh, okay, so <laughs> whenever you begin anything ambitious, the first thing that you're going to realize is that uh, it, it can be incredibly daunting. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, it, it, one approach is, <laughs> is to be very bold and, and very fearless, right? Uh, and another is, is just one of humility, right? And so uh, there's this quote that I'm sure all of you have heard before from Lao Tzu, uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's, uh, you got to be at least a little bit bold to go on the journey, but uh, you have to be a little humble um, in realizing that no matter how quick you are, uh, it's, it's still going to be a long while. It's going to be a long grind. Um, but you got to start, right? Uh, so uh, let's let's take a step together, right? Like if we were to approach this problem, like from from a serious perspective, right? If you were to jump in and be told, all right, you know, you have, uh, I don't know, <laughs> you have a week to tell me how long it takes you to solve this problem, uh, then I think the best approach is to go as quickly as you can during that week. Uh, and if you're going to go as quickly as you can. Uh, you have to, to front load the work, you front load the effort. You do as much work as as is obvious, right? Everything that you can possibly think of that needs to be done, and you just do it as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, if you run out of that, then that's perfect. Then that is the perfect time to sit around and continue to speculate uh, about how to advance the problem further. Um, and so uh, let's dig into it, right? What is that first hour of that first week uh, of effort, uh, what does that look like from a, a development perspective, and, um, and then how do we you know, use that going forward, right? Uh, okay, so uh, great, we're starting this, right? Well, we don't start with code, right? We start with nouns. Uh, we, uh, the modern approach to programming uh, is very heavy on the concept of, of objects. It's object-oriented programming. Uh, and so whenever you uh, develop from that paradigm, uh, then you begin with classes, and the classes are the nouns of the problem, right? So let's discuss it. Let's get on a whiteboard to discuss what we think are, are the relevant uh, things that deserve a class in this problem, uh, and then see if we can create the classes for them, the actions that would be taken against those particular nouns, uh, and then once we have that in mind, uh, you know, kind of as we go along, then um, We'll discuss what data needs to be persisted and how to solve or approach that problem, uh, and uh, and we'll go from there. We'll see how far we can get now. Um, uh, okay, so. Uh, the first thing uh, that, that I would pick, right, uh, because this is a, a scientific concept and because uh, you're attempting essentially to write a program to verify a concept, right? so uh, I want to write a program that will either tell me where my model is incomplete uh, or ideally that will provide evidence to suggest that, yeah, this is, this is really what's happening. Look, if you, if you do this and it behaves and it exhibits all of these uh, these symptoms that we measure whenever we consider these physical phenomena, uh, and, and so you could generate it out from the, the mathematical model uh, through the program. Right? So that would be the ultimate win uh, in this. Uh, and then you know from there you could you know, discuss what, what you could do with it, what possible results are. Uh, but uh, because it is, um, that would be one possible aim for this. I, uh, if it is to be a serious attempt, then uh, you have to begin with the math. And the math, the first thing you have to discuss is a covering. So you have to be able to say that when I speak of this problem, when I speak of this collection of things, whatever noun we decide ends up being the relevant thing uh, that's going on here that describes the problem, uh, that I'm speaking about it universally. I have covered every possible area of this. Uh, I, I, you know, ideally, we would be able to show uh, if we're claiming that uh, conservation of surface area plays a role, and we would have to be able to show that surface area is conserved as the problem moves along. Uh, and then uh, there would be other concepts like um, 
the amount of charge exhibited from it. Uh, and so uh, you would have to find some way to, to roll up all of that data uh, and show how it behaves. Uh, and then you could start to make the one-to-one -one analogs between our, our current understanding and, um, and what is explained by the model. Uh, so because I think we should begin with the covering, because it, it gives you that grasp on the problem, it is the collection of which everything else will speak of, uh, then that's really the first thing, uh, the first noun. So let's visualize what that is uh, whenever we speak of it. So uh, we have something that looks a lot like whenever we considered the, the original case where we had just the string and then we were vibrating it in a second dimension. Right? So we've broken it down into two dimensions. Um, and so uh, it, uh, it's possible to project the four dimensional space down to two dimensions in the same way that we do so uh, in the, the three dimensional world. Uh, if you just look straight down a line, uh, then you know you you have a, a plane essentially that that you are visualizing. Uh, there's the one that's straight in front of you, and and the one perpendicular to it, which uh, you know is being projected onto our our uh, retina. Right? Um, okay, so <laughs> if we do that projection, right, uh, then in one direction uh, we have the displacement, uh, which is uh, essentially the, the amplitude, the, the vertical displacement of uh, our surface. Uh, and so because X, Y, and Z are so familiar spatial ones, uh, we should reserve those for whenever we're talking about movement on the surface, which is, is exactly what is what's familiar to us, right? When we think about moving through space, we think about moving through X, Y, and Z, right? So let's use W for this other one. Uh, and then, uh, because X, Y, and Z are all specific and we don't want to limit it to it, uh, let's use another variable. So we're going to use a, a Greek letter. We're going to use the letter rho uh, because that's typically used for radius. Right? So just if you go in this direction, pick a direction, it doesn't matter. If you go in this direction, then it looks kind of like this. Right? So rho, right? So you're just going straight, pick your direction. Uh, okay, so now uh, <laughs> this becomes the, the bunching of the surface. Um, and so uh, so now whenever we discuss the covering, which was the, the motivation behind visualizing this to begin with, uh, I propose that we go with covering um, that was uh, the analog of the topographical maps. So whenever we used sea level uh, and we, we carved out uh, the, the charts of our atlas um, from uh, all of the points on the surface of the earth that are below sea level uh, and all of the points that are above it. Uh, and we will say that it's all right if you duplicate the boundary, right? And, and it'll be all right for two reasons. Uh, well, for we could do three things, right? We could duplicate it or we could throw it away and they're equivalently good. And, and uh, perhaps we'll elaborate on that later. Uh, but <laughs> the result will essentially be that the displacement is always zero, right? So even if you factor that in, right? Even if you said it had you know, some action, well, the displacement was zero. It's, it's really where no action is happening. The, the boundary may move around, uh, but it's never really acting, right? It's always zero. Right? Uh, and so because its net result is zero from zero motivation, uh, you know, it's okay if you duplicate zero. You can always add zero. Um, anyway, 
Uh, and then also, uh, because it's uh, scaled down in the dimension, right? Like here it's points. Uh, in uh, the, the higher dimension, it'll be uh, R2. So it'll be uh, these planes that are getting tossed away or whatever. Uh, it's something in R2. Right? Uh, well, it'll be uh, a surface, right? So it'll be the surface of this hole, which we will discuss, right? <laughs> anyway. Uh, so because of that, it has measure zero, and so it's also thrown away. So there's, we don't really need to worry about the boundary so long as we don't duplicate regions, and that's the spirit of what we're going for. Uh, okay, so now let's define those regions that, that will become our covering. Okay, uh, and I guess it would help to color code, but you can kind of see already. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I've, uh, I've color-coded these regions, uh, I guess because that's what's familiar, but really whenever we discuss about it, whenever we discuss it, we're going to want to discuss it in uh, in the dimension of the surface, right? So there are these regions, right? Uh, but that's not uh, what we will perceive to be charged. What's important is actually it going to end up being the slope, uh, if I'm correct. Right? So. Really, we want to pay attention to the string and what the string is doing. Uh, okay, so you can kind of see that. Um, uh, okay, uh, but the surface, right, we'll pay attention to it and we'll, we'll ask all of these questions uh, based on, on where it is, <laughs> where the swell is, right, relative to, to sea level. Um, okay, so uh, there's another point that I think we should discuss uh, as, as we move along. So uh, there, there are just too many points in space, right? Uh, so it, we'll never be able to count the continuum. It, it is uncountably infinite, uh, and we already have trouble with countably infinite. Right? Um, so the best we could do is approximate it. Uh, and so now we have to discuss, okay, well, what's the best way to approximate it? Because we are trying to move this into, you know, some, um, some finite state machine, right? Uh, so um, the simplest way to do it, uh, I believe, is going to be um, to um, to store the regions, right? Uh, so to look at these regions um, right here. So you store the boundary, right? So you store something that's like a, a path or uh, that uh, that would, uh, whenever we discuss it in terms of a surface area of R3, uh, that would create this hole, like a, a submarine, right? Like you're, uh, you're, you're filling the world with submarines. Every, you know, every blade of grass and, and every 
uh, atom of air is going inside some hole, something that has this closed surface. Um, but it's going to be, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> they'll be very small so for me, so they'll be very video. Um, but, um, it, but it's, it's a surface, right? And then we talk about it possessing certain things on the inside. Um, so in the case of a submarine, it would have its own air pressure, it would have its own, uh, you know, uh, ratios of uh, molecules in the air, right? Its own, its own atmospheric uh, breakdown. Um, and so it's, it's closed off, it has its own properties. Uh, and so you can discuss those properties. There's where the sub is, uh, and you could represent it with a dot on the screen of the sub's, uh, you know, center of mass, like where its center is. Right? Uh, and so just like that, uh, just like that, our, our holes, our, our submarines, uh, can uh, have properties just like that as well. Uh, and so uh, there's going to be uh, the boundary, right, where, where the surface of our, uh, our enclosure is. Uh, and then there's going to be an extreme point. Uh, so we know <laughs> from this, right, because it's, it's not constantly zero, it's not flat, we know that uh, whenever you have some region that's enclosed by that common boundary, uh, that it will have um, some, uh, it'll either be positive or negative. Uh, and because it's, it's closed and bounded, uh, it's going to have an extreme point, uh, and that, that is a theory you get to deal with later. Um, and so, uh, so the extreme point becomes a point of information. It's just like the, the ship's center of mass, or you know, planet's center of mass, or whatever. Uh, okay, uh, and so, I guess I, I should be writing this down as we go along. Right? So, uh, so our covering uh, so let's say that this is our class, right? We know that we want a covering. Uh, and so we're also going to want a hole, right? Like the, <laughs> I was just saying, it's this enclosure. Right? So uh, a thing with boundaries and, and so forth, boundaries and extreme points. Um, so we know that we want that to be a collection. I've represented it as just a, you know, with the shorthand for array or collection or something that's indexable. Um, so now we have a, a second class. Uh, so what are the properties of hull? Uh, so uh, it's going to have, um, <laughs> well, uh, it's going to have extreme points, right? So uh, uh, okay. So let's change this to uh, to have the the name. Uh, and then the time frame. Uh, Uh, okay, so uh, so now uh, we've called we've stated that there is one extrema, right? One extreme point, uh, but we've also said uh, that it's a bit like a, a pug's face, right? Like that there's just more wrinkles. So who's to say that this thing looks like this, and that it doesn't look uh, more like this one, where I can't see it's all jaggedy, but. Instead of being smooth like this hill, it's more, uh, not necessarily jagged, but, uh, 
but uh, active. <laughs> there's, there's just more wrinkles in it, right? Uh, so every one of these Every one of those points, or every one of those crests is itself uh, an extreme point in some local neighborhood. So then how do we represent this? Right? Like this is, <laughs> we're already finding this bulky bridge, right? Uh, okay, well hang in there, right? Like it's, uh, you know, a thousand miles is a long way. We're only like 15 minutes in. Um, okay, so, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so we have these additional extreme points and they're, they're in the direction, right? The, they're in the extrema direction that we're really looking for. Um, and uh, we can still subdivide it, right? So it'll have some value and it's a local maximum. Right? So uh, if you imagine um, like pouring honey on top of something round, right? like maybe uh, ice cream or something, I, I don't know, I'm struggling for something round, right? So you pour a thing that's kind of, kind of liquidy, right, on top of this, uh, and it never runs quite smooth, but imagine that it came down and it did run smooth. It ran perfectly down uh, smooth and created this dome as it went down. And so you continue dripping it down and the dome continues to go down uh, until, right, so, So the dome is, you start here, right, and the dome continues to spread, right. and then eventually it reaches this point where, um, where there's a direction that as the dome spreads, like as you continue to create these contours of, of increasing radius, uh, that, uh, and maybe not radius because it doesn't have to be a perfect uh, it doesn't have to be a perfect circle uh, they can be you know, saddle points or whatever but yeah eventually you will reach this this saddle point which is the the low point of some other peak uh, so then this now you could represent as a new enclosure right from from there until wherever right and so the analog that we have is whenever we do contour maps of, of mountains or mountain ranges or uh, you know, cities or, or whatever, um, we do the contours uh, as <laughs> our level sets the correct word. I, I don't remember, right? But we do the contours as uh, these increasing like level above sea level, right? And so you know, perfectly analogous to that, uh, the contour will eventually have uh, it'll have some low point that um, essentially everything around it can be. And it's still gonna be above sea level. And if it's not above sea level, well then it's already its own thing. It's already its own perfect hill, right? If, if that low point was sea level, then we've already identified it as that, right? Uh, okay, so it might be to our advantage, and, and we can peek ahead and tell you that it will be to our advantage uh, to be able to retain some knowledge of this thing inside of some larger blob, right? Like you, you maintain your identity as you're, you're swallowed by the blob. Uh, so we, we should do that. We should have a, a blob that grows like that. Um, okay, so, so now we can envision every one of these little mini crests as some, uh, <laughs> some little wavelet that was swallowed by some larger uh, blobby type wave. Um, uh, and so like they continue to have their own little identity and they continue to move around you know, within it. Uh, and so now the next question is, okay, well, is that the only time? Is there some point when it should, when it should lose its identity? Um, and, uh, okay, well, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think uh, it should lose its identity, um, but let's consider this problem, uh, I guess, as, as the Greeks would have, right? So, you know, just sit and think, right? And uh, it was hypothesized back then that there was some some smallest unit, some some minimal thing upon which everything else is, is made up of. Uh, and so uh, it might have been water, right? <laughs> it might have been one of the, the five or the four elements, right? Uh, but um, 
you know, uh, it, you could think of it as something smaller. And, and whenever we found the atom, we're like, ah, oh, yes, well, these are the smallest things, right? Like the baryons and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, then, you know, light and, and everything else, it, you know, it, and light can continue to get uh, smaller and smaller uh, frequencies and, and so forth. Uh, so then, you know, uh, what would be the appropriate smallest thing that, that is truly everything? Uh, well, Okay, so as we're postulating this, right, the answer would be, well, it's, you know, it's this, this wave, this little wave, um, but, um, uh, okay, so imagine um, a, uh, a prism, right, so you pass white light through it, and you get the, the Pink Floyd style, uh, you know, spectrum, the, the rainbow, the color spectrum, uh, and, uh, and, and so you've taken this, this thing that was all one frequency, or, you know, eh, more or less one frequency, and you split it up and you've shown that, well, you know, it was actually hiding all of these other wavelengths of light. Uh, and so you can see this full spectrum. Uh, and so, you know, we've, we've already hypothesized that, uh, you know, there's this constant um, uh, uh, dampening effect uh, from, uh, from tidal forces on the waves of light. So, you know, they're acting as gravity and so on and so forth. So even if you have something that is, you know, this common wave, you know, at, at, at some fundamental level, even at that smallest level, it's still going to experience it. It's not uh, going to contribute as much energy to the system as, as the other things that are, are going on. So it's, uh, you know, perhaps forgettable. It's perhaps a, you know, a, a diminishing uh, wave crest. Um, but uh, because of this constant action, um, you know, it's fair to say that even something that does begin with this will eventually progress to, you know, from there. Right, to something like that, where eventually something else kicks in and, you know, this part, you know, it pulls and it, it introduces, you know, two from what was one. Uh, or it may be possible, um, and we're going to speculate about this whenever we get to, to building atoms, right? Uh, and so uh, it may be possible for collections of, of waves or little crests like this um, to come together. Uh, and so, um, let's see, where can we see? Uh, and so if you allow for uh, superposition of waves or uh, wave interference, then uh, these two crests, when they come together, they'll have this additive property and they'll come together and they'll create this larger one. Uh, and so it's possible for, you know, we, we presume <laughs> that, that it's possible uh, for these things to come together and create these higher states, right? So. Uh, so where does matter come from in the first place? Where does, um, uh, you know, uh, how do we get the heavier elements from, from just those uh, lowly baryons, from the, the neutrons and the, the protons? Uh, and so uh, the idea is that they, these waves, they come together and they create something that is of a, a higher energy state. Uh, and then while it's in that higher state, it's, uh, you know, the slope is sufficient to hold them all together. Uh, and so it's a fair bet that uh, the reason will be because uh, it, it's going to have some regular um, polygon structure, right? So these things come together, right? And, and you see them, uh, I guess, in their, uh, you know, their synchronized swimming formation or whatever, right? right? So you have these wave crests. Now we're looking down on it. And so this is the plane. Uh, then they'll come together and the swell will be in the middle of them, right? And so they'll come together and through wave interference, uh, like erecting a, a tent, a, a big top tent, right? So you, uh, it's, it's flat and these things come together and it rises and it creates this new crest. Uh, and then 
the, it, it just it has the right amount of pressure and the right support through geometry, through the strength of geometry, uh, that it holds together. And, and so it's, it's come together and it's created this new uh, higher energy state, which is stable and, and it doesn't you know, necessarily want to break down. And so I, I, I am predicting uh, that we're going to encounter this pattern over and over again, where they, they come together at some higher energy level. And then whenever the big top starts resting, it, it has the support uh, so that now you have this, this bigger tent essentially from these smaller elements. Um, okay, so if we're gonna consider this, right? Like, so we want it to be able to represent these higher energy wave states uh, and, uh, you know, and, and we have to uh, demonstrate essentially why it's stable and, and uh, equally important that if we allow it to evolve, that it'll break down and it'll remember that it was originally composed of these five smaller uh you know little uh, wave crests um then uh then we need to be able to represent that right so we need a name for this thing this one which <laughs> as far as we can tell it doesn't really exist it's this concept it's the center for for this other structure uh and so but once it comes into existence that becomes the thing that you think about right so we don't talk about the stanchion, the right word, the, the posts or whatever. And we don't talk about the, the tent poles. We talk about the tent, right? Once it's erected, then we're talking about the, the tent, the thing that's actually been created. Uh, and so this essentially defines the character of how it behaves. So let's, let's call it the characteristic point. So whenever you have something that like this, where it's composed of these smaller things, um, but it, it essentially comes into existence and, and it only exists so long as everything is held together, uh, then, uh, then that's the type of thing that it makes sense to, to bring into existence and then to, uh, to actually dispose of later. But these smallest things, you know, as far as we know, and, and we will define them as, as this initial state, you know, as we uh, go on to, to set it in motion, hopefully. Uh, you know, we'll talk about that, but but this one, the one that's purely a concept, that one will come to life and, and be disposed of, but these smaller ones should persist always. Uh, and so the question is, you know, once you have some initial state, how do you know which is which? Uh, yeah, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, well, we'll work through it, right? Um, okay, um, so we have these conceptual ones, right? But what about, like, you know, if, if we're going to see this pattern over and over again, and we want it to be abstract and flexible enough, and you know, maybe it makes sense to do that, maybe it doesn't. But what about the, you know, the the Earth Moon system? So if we were to measure gravitational uh, uh, potential, right, the the gravitational potential, then the the low points, the extreme points, uh, are it's going to be in the very center of the system, but that is inside the radius of the Earth. Right? And so, you know, as you're moving towards it, you would probably be drawn towards that one point. So do we need a second one to come along? Uh, and so uh, this, <laughs> this is another branch point that, you know, as we identify this new problem, then we have to discuss, okay, well, how do we handle this additional case where, uh, where it's completely uh, dominated by, by another one? Um, and so uh, the, the term that is used that was used in uh, the the parallel hard drives, the uh, and it's used in other patterns as well, is uh, master slave. So, uh, in the case of the the Earth Moon system, um, the dominant object uh, is going to be uh, the Earth, and uh, and the subject is going to be the the Moon, um, and so. Uh, in that case, uh, we we have to make a decision. How are we going to represent that? Are we going to bring something in uh, every time we have something that fits that bill? Every time, you know, the blob swallows something new, you know, uh, or uh, if it is dominated by by something that already exists, uh, presumably these things, right? These these composite objects that are going around and acting on behalf of everything acting on behalf as a, a collection right so everything moves with it uh, every planet in our system moves with the sun right? they're completely uh, owned by the sun in essence um, 
so uh, in that case, I think it makes sense to uh, to um, to allow that hole, the 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 dominant uh, region, the the one that acts as the characteristic point for everything else, right? We we think of this as the sun system because the center is you know within the radius of the sun. Uh, so I, I think at that point it makes sense to um, to represent those as as fully owned subsidiaries of, of whatever that dominant object is. Uh, and so we want the flexibility for both, right? So to create a new object whenever you have something uh, that forms a uh, a strong uh, and resilient geometric structure, right? And the ability to just eat other energy, right? Swallow other energy. Uh, whenever you have something that is already dominant and something else wanders into its midst. Uh, okay, so <laughs> the hole is still what we were discussing, right? Every one of these crests, these dots, these are all holes, even this virtual object that we call, right? Um, but we're going to want to <laughs> represent that, you know, this is this is marked for teardown and some of these others are not, right? So we still have this concept of this fundamental unit of energy and it's going to be these little these little ones uh, that never go away. Um, okay, so, uh, so <laughs> let's go back. Uh, well, we, we have the visualization. Uh, you know, we've got a couple of nouns. Uh, let's code up what we've got <laughs> and then see what's missing uh, and how we can uh, further discuss the problem. Uh, okay, um, so we're going to do this in .NET uh, just because um, it's uh, what I'm most familiar with. So we're doing it in .NET 5. Hello world, let's make sure it works. Uh, okay, excellent. So let's change that just to indicate that it's run. Uh, all right, so the data, the, the thing that is going to be represented in memory uh, uh, we've been referring to it as models, um, so let's continue to refer to them as models. Um, so we know of two types so far. Uh, we know of a covering, uh, and then we know that that will make reference to a hole. Uh, we additionally know uh, that we're going to want to represent points. Uh, well, that's enough for now. Um, so a point is probably the easiest thing. Uh, so we're going to use system, declare our namespace. Again, the access modifiers, right? Public means that anything can access it. Anything that has access to the code will have visualization. Uh, it's going to be a class point. It's going to follow the same name as the file name. Uh, and then just public getters and setters will do. Uh, so we're going to want double. Uh, so then there's x, y, and z. Uh, but still going to want getters and setters, just uh, for good practice. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so the hole, as we've discussed, uh, is going to have an extreme point. to know um, right, whether this extreme point uh, is the result of some composite structure uh, or um, if it's some atomic unit, right? So atomic in the, the Greek sense, not in the um, physics sense. <laughs> okay, uh, so public uh, bool is composite. Uh, well, and even that's misleading because even the the ones where there's this dominant point I and mean, where it's swallowed up everything else uh, around, um, uh, might still be composed of other things. So, is there a better name for uh, for this check to see whether or not it's uh, some virtual point. Uh, so we could say is extreme point virtual, uh, but that's extremely <laughs> verbose. Right? Uh, so let's leave it as, as composite for now and we'll see if we can come up with something better later. Um, okay, uh, so the hole is also going to have a boundary. We don't exactly have a, a concept of a boundary. So how do we want to represent it? Um, we know that it's going to be uh, a collection of points, right? but more than that, it's a continuum of points. Um, so uh, you know, we, we need some concept of that. Um, so this is a good time to discuss how we're going to represent the, the object, the concept of space itself, uh, and um, <laughs> what, uh, how we process that. Uh, okay, so let's see, does everything have enough to at least compile? Completed. Okay, excellent. Uh, all right, so we already have points. Um, so one way to represent them, I have this collection uh, space. It's going to be something. It's going to be a collection of points. Uh, we'll guess that it's a list, right? but we'll probably end up modifying that really quickly. Uh, okay, so uh, we can create a new point for for everything, uh, and we use list because it's variable and it's flexible and you can add to it. But something tells me that on whatever scale we choose, if we're representing every point in space, this thing that is thrice infinite. <laughs> thrice the, uh, uh, on the order of uh, the continuum, then we're not going to want to create that a lot. Really, we're going to want to update those values in space. So it might be advantageous to have an object that is the field itself. Right? So something that represents uh, everything on the surface that we're considering. Uh, and then it holds the displacement value uh, of that point relative to sea level. Um, so, uh, so let's create that as an, an object, something that is you know, created just one time. Or, well, that is not the definition of an object, but uh, we're going to create it as something that is, is generated exactly once. Uh, 
Uh, well, this seems like a, the time to introduce you to the singleton pattern. Uh, if you have something that you want only created once, uh, you can create it as a singleton. Um, so it's still a, a class. We have to give it a namespace. Uh, okay, so for the singleton, <laughs> if you're going to create it, uh, then you hold a reference to the instance itself. And so we're going to have a field variable. We'll call it instance because it's the only one that there is. Um, okay, uh, so then it's also it's going to have a private constructor, which means that only something, only a function inside of the the class can refer to it. Uh, and so now you're going to see where the getters and setters come into play. Right? Uh, so the prescribed variable name is get instance. Uh, so this is static, which means this has to be static. Uh, and again, those are stored in different locations in memory. In static variables, uh, you have one instance of a static variable uh, per class, not per class instance, right? So not every time you instantiate a point, right? But for all of them, anytime you create one, they all refer to the same static, whatever, static function, static uh, variable in this case. Um, so then we're going to define something that, and I guess you'll see how to, to access it, um, that is scoped static. So get instance. Uh, it's really a function. You're never setting it, right? so we'll treat it as a function. Uh, so if instance is null, then we're going to initialize it. Right? So the trick was something inside the class has to access it, and so we're doing it through a static. Uh, method. Uh, when we return the instance. So I want to highlight that this is not thread safe. Right? So if this were thread safe, then we would check if it's null, and then we would lock on something. So it doesn't really matter. We just need something that is referenced, right? And something that's static, so that there's only ever one instance. And so the very first time this is referred to by anything, this gets created. And so this doesn't update. It only happens in the initializer phase, which happens the very first time this is referenced. So this is guaranteed to be the same for all threads. Uh, so we lock on that thing whose sole purpose is to be the, the conch. Uh, and then we create this region where only the current thread can access it. So now we have this thread safe function. And then, well, it's possible that we were locked out of this region if two threads tried to access this really quickly. So then we do a second check. Once to see if we should even bother to try to create a new instance. And then the second time, once we're guaranteed the right to update this variable, then uh, then we actually assign it. Uh, and in that way, we're guaranteed to get the, the single instance. So now we always return this. This part, it gets checked every time, but it only executes hopefully once. Uh, but this part is guaranteed. Uh, well, this part is guaranteed to execute exactly once because of all of the, the trouble we've gone through. Uh, okay, so now we have just a single field instance. So this constructor will only execute once every time the program is executed. Okay, uh, so so how much uh, memory do we want to uh, do we want to consume here? So now we're dealing with instance variables, not static ones, uh, and so we are going to have points in R three. So if we were to represent it with arrays, uh, then we would have uh, an array.
array of an array of an array of doubles. But we don't want to necessarily initialize it here, right? uh, because we haven't actually specified. We should we've declared it as a double, but we haven't said what the size of it is. Right, so let's move it in here. We'll defer initialization uh, for the constructor, uh, and this gives us a, a chance to specify like how detailed do we want it, you know, potentially. Um, for now, uh, I don't want to pass that in. Right? I want it to be some constant that's defined for the function uh, or for the for the program. Uh, so we could declare it right here uh, as some constant constant. Uh, let's see, uh, samples per dimension. say a thousand right? so a thousand times a thousand times a thousand that means that we have uh, 10 to the 3 cubed right so 10 to the 9 variables uh, so we're storing at this point a billion doubles uh, 8 bytes per double that's 8 gigabytes of memory to store the field right? um, so uh, maybe we don't want that many. <laughs> so if we scale it down to just a hundred, right? Uh, then it's uh, ten squared cubed, so ten to the six. So now we're only storing uh, a million uh, doubles. That's eight megabytes of memory. It's uh, more achievable. It costs us less. Uh, and so we have a. Uh, uh, a million points, uh, but we might want something in between, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, let's do uh, 200. So now this is eight times what we had before, right? So eight billion points seems like a reasonable compromise. It's still a fair bit of data, and we can move it up or down as we want. Uh, so now. So now if we want to change this, we just change it here and it'll update there. But you know, we might have other things like this where we want to specify it. We might want to tune it, but we're not going to want to dig around too many places for it. Uh, so let's create something on this top level. Okay? And we'll put certain configuration choices here. We'll call it constants. Uh, and it's going to be a static class. Nothing will ever change on it. Um, we just want a, a place where we can declare the stuff that we're going to tune. Okay? And maybe later we would move this into a configuration file or something like that. Um, but let's move this thing here. Let's see if it has visibility. <laughs> that should be public. Does it still run? Let's 
So we got an invalid rank specifier. Okay, so uh, let's follow the advice and we'll specify it in this manner. issues like that along the way. Uh, but we were able to move this to the constants class, uh, and so that'll be used to just tune it. Maybe you want to make a note of where it's consumed. So uh, you just put field.cs. Uh, okay, uh, so we have uh, this thing that is 200 by 200 by 200. Uh, and at each one of those points, uh, it's going to have a double. Uh, so now we have uh, these uh, points with serial numbers, essentially. So the, the X, the Y, and the, the Z serial number. And we'll u uniquely reference every one of those points. But, um, but we were talking about a sphere. Right? So um, yeah, let's... Uh, okay, so we need to represent this thing as a sphere, not as a grid. So, uh, okay. So as it stands, right, we have something that's in the traditional Cartesian. And now we have all of these slices, 200 that way. that way, 200 this way. Right. Um, but uh, that's not, I mean, that's that's not going to do any better than, is it the Mercator map, the one that uh, is so commonly used, where, uh, where Greenland looks to be about the same size as Africa, right? Uh, so, uh, so it's, it's just terrible as you get out to the extreme points. We want something that's a bit more round. So, um, it makes sense in that case to use uh, something like polar coordinates uh, in order to represent this surface. Um, so we have, uh, uh, okay, so let's do it in the three dimensional sense and we'll talk about what we would do for, for four dimensions or what we will do for four dimensions. Um, Uh, okay, so let's go back to our topographic map of, of the Earth, right? Uh, so we did it with sea level, right? But, um, you know, is there a way that we could do it uh, spherically <laughs> using uh, polar coordinates? Um, well, yeah, you know, uh, even even if, you know, there's regions you know, of right, elevation and, and depression or whatever, right, on the surface, uh, 
each one of those is going to have some radial distance from from the center of the Earth. So from the the center of mass of the Earth, not the uh, the minimum gravitational potential, <laughs> uh, right? Which is is the very center of the Earth Moon system. Uh, okay. So then, uh, yeah. Uh, so now we can just use polar coordinates, right? So there's this radial length, right? All right. Uh, and then uh, there's the way you rotated the vector to get there, right? So so you rotated it via two planes, right? So first you rotated it around the z-axis, right? That's the azimuth, right? I think that's, I, I don't know, it's going to be phi, the, uh, it's going to be phi, theta, or, or uh, psi, <laughs> one of those, right? So uh, we'll call it theta, right? That's why you're rotating it about the z-axis while lying flat on the xyz, on the xy plane. Uh, and then there's the altitude, how much you had to move the arm up, essentially, to, to look straight at the point that you want. And so I think that one is phi. Right? So now every point on the surface, right, it has its, like you can use the charts or whatever, uh, but if you wanted to represent it, um, you know, uh, something where the points can be thought of as being evenly distributed, uh, then, uh, you know, breaking it down this way instead of the Cartesian way might make more sense. So now we have these radian, right, <laughs> we're using uh, something very much like radius, right, but I, I guess it's closer to degrees, right, where we've numbered it, uh, you know, we could modify it to 360 if we wanted, right, uh, instead of 200, 360, right, and it's still, it, it would still be representable on a modern computer and uh, maps perfectly to our concept, so you know what, let's do that, let's change it. 360. I'm doing that in my code. Uh, and then, uh, and so now each one of these is, is broken down into those degrees, right? Uh, okay, so now a point is no longer XYZ. It is, but eh, it's, it's not necessarily right. It's the radial distance from the center. The azimuth, the, the rotation before you lift the arm. Right? And then the altitude, uh, so how much you move it up once you're there. Right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, we can talk about equivalence classes to make sure that no points get repeated as well, right? So 360 is the same as uh, zero. Right? Um, so now each one of these has their own, you know, serial number or you know ID uh, that maps to some unique point on, uh, on the surface uh, and so we can do the same thing in four dimensions as well right uh, so now uh, so we would have to add uh, an additional variable uh, to <laughs> to go around our, uh, our you know our hypersurface right um, but uh, I I want to make a modification here. So we defined this in terms of um, in terms of radial distance from the center, and that is the essence of what we want. However, right, if we were to take an average of distance from the center from this uh, center point, then we could define a sea level. Right. So so this thing now becomes sea level. And so <laughs> equivalent, like after taking the average and, and defining what sea level is, uh, then uh, it becomes equivalent to say deviation from sea level, right? So miles above sea level or feet above sea level or, or whatever, um, you know, the, the same is true here, right? So now uh, radius becomes displacement from sea level. So let's change this from R to D. So now it's going to be a much smaller value that we're we're looking at, and because we're looking for such small deviations, it makes sense, right? Rather than trying to compute it from this, the, you know, from the radius of the universe, which 
<laughs> might not have that information available, but we could conceive of uh, local locally flat space time, right? Like we could conceive of that. Um, okay, so uh, so we know we're going to need one more angle whenever we're dealing with this in four dimensions. So the four dimensional case will have displacement. Uh, azimuth, altitude, and I had one for that. Uh, I don't remember. Um, maybe uh, direction, orientation, hemisphere. Uh, I don't remember, but it's going to indicate essentially where we are uh, in uh, that overall scheme. Uh, okay, so we have those those four variables, uh, and so now this displacement, um, you know, uh, is what we're going to store as the extrema. And then whenever it's zero, that will define the holes that are interesting. Right? Uh, and so the holes will have an extreme point. The hole will. Uh, and potentially um, multiple uh, extreme points. Right? Uh, and so one of the things that uh, you know, I, I wanted to discuss before we moved on is you know, the case of the electron. So it, it seems to hop about. Uh, but now that we have, uh, <laughs> we have these terms, this vernacular that we can use to discuss this, uh, so uh, we're saying that you know it's it, you know slope is really going to play a role in what we think of as charge, and then the the crumpled up nature of it overall is going to create this sagging effect, which you know will be realized as gravity on a on a cumulative scale and so forth. Um, but you know what's happening with the electron, and what is it that whenever we consider it as a point and so on and so forth? I, I think whenever it's a point, it <laughs> it just interacts with the characteristic point. Everything kind of rallies around this central point. Uh, and there are cases where uh, it will appear to jump around or whatever because the, the characteristic point kind of shifts as it, as it moves around. Uh, something shifts, the interference changes, and that extreme point will appear to hop or it'll appear to be in two places at once. But by and large, it's it's going to have you know just that <laughs> that point thing whenever whenever it's tested whenever it has something that uh, everything will kind of you know tighten up around it uh, then it'll behave as that point which I, th I think is why the characteristic point is the the interesting thing to think of uh, because whenever we think of these things as having these as these point particles that that I, I think that's what we're actually seeing right um, okay so we kind of have a vocabulary to discuss it we know a few of the classes that we'd want to create. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's see uh, what else we can come up with uh, and what modifications we have in the next few minutes. Um, and then, um, yeah, we can be done. Uh, okay, so now this is going to run from 0 to 359. Right? Uh, so it's just the, the degrees around the, the sphere. Uh, and then the value that we'll be storing there is the displacement. So the field uh, is now all of our points. Uh, and so it doesn't make sense to discuss a point in terms of um, uh, having some x, y, and z that are uh, not integers. A point has now become uh, a serial number. So uh, it's, uh, it's going to have a displacement value. Right? Um, and so we can discuss that. Uh, so public double. Uh, and we can call it displacement. Um, but we'd already discussed calling it w. Uh, because X, Y, and Z were the spatial ones. Um, but I guess, you know, we're in code. Uh, we can leave a comment that says this is the same thing as W. Right? Uh, but we're going to probably speak of it as displacement. Uh, and then uh, this will be degrees theta degrees uh, phi 
and then degrees uh, psi. Uh, and so this will define a ray uh, <laughs> coming out from the center, the center of the universe, right, or, or whatever center we're discussing. Um, and then uh, the displacement will say how far from sea level. Right? Uh, and so now a point can be represented um, uh, now we can discuss a, a subset of the points where these agree with points on the field right? uh, and the point on the field will have you know some value and maybe we update that each time the system updates so that we make sure that we conserve surface area but as we discuss the, the wave energy moving around um, there's going to be characteristic points and there's going to be boundaries and those get updated uh, and so that is really where the interaction is going to happen um, and the field is going to be a summation of, of uh, all of these waves, these little crests that are moving around, uh, interfering with one another. Um, and so the field is the cumulative effect and then these are the uh, those smallest corpuscles of energy, right? those smallest wrinkles uh, of which we are measuring. Uh, and so the, the thought is that we can use this um, to like now that we have that's uh, <laughs> now that we're out of time right but now that we have this you know this vocabulary and, and this idea of how we would represent these objects in in memory um, you know we can discuss it uh, further right like we can model it we can make sure that all of these things that we wish to be conserved are uh, and then you know you start to test it against known behaviors and uh, and you adjust it um, you know, if it, uh, <laughs> if your current representation is, is erroneous, but uh, we have enough motivation to continue on, um, you know, under the, the belief that, uh, yeah, there, there might be something at the end of this thread. Um, and so, uh, you know, what do you do with this once, <laughs> once you have it, like once you have this ability to, to represent it? Uh, and so, you know, <laughs> at this point, it's, you know, it's fair to, to dream a little bit, right? Like how, how far do you take this thing? Uh, and so, um, you know, the first thing that I would want to do, so if we have this, right, and we, the first thing I would want to do is create, um, you know, a pair production, right? So uh, you can uh, create these initial setups, right? Like you, you start composing it of all of this energy and you continue to increase the energy density uh, until eventually you're able to simulate something that uh, through the rules that you've set up and, and through these initial velocities um, and, like once they sit on top of each other, the, the shape the field takes and how they continue to evolve with each other, the motion updates as a result of the field and the field updates as a result of where the energy is located. Um, so, uh, right, all of that continues to, uh, it, you have the representation and then you start playing it forward and you make sure that, you know, that we said surface area needs to be conserved so that you're able to count, <laughs> you're able to integrate that value of surface area and make sure that you're enforcing that. Um, and then as you play it forward, like how, how does it behave? Um, and once you get pair production, then, uh, you know, to create it and, and try and recreate all the phenomena that we see. Uh, so try and use it to create, you know, neutron and anti-neutron pairs. Uh, use it to, uh, you know, eject uh, both light and, um, you know, uh, electrons and stuff from, from the nucleus. And then uh, one of the things that we didn't really get to discuss, but that I thought might be interesting is, uh, okay, so if you have this conservation of, of surface area, essentially, uh, but you also have all of this wave behavior, then uh, you can imagine uh, that, you know, yeah, maybe <laughs> it, it, it might help visualizing to think of something as happening on the interior of this hypersphere. Um, and so, you know, like <laughs> something is pushing up against the surface or whatever, and you have this cancellation of wave, right? Like you have a trough and it needs a crest and they cancel, but then you have the surface area. Uh, and so rather than being this truly flat boundary, it's, it's this like crumpled up Coke can essentially, right? So it's just, it's got all of these wrinkles and it's just really uh, condensed, but it could, you know, expand later and, and allow for wave propagation and so forth. Um, and so, um, yeah, and then you would also make sure you enforce rules like, uh, you know, and how it updates and so forth. But um, so there's, there's, there would be a lot of tests that would be added to make sure that you're 
uh, you're hammering away at it uh, appropriately and, and making sure that you know it's set up properly and then uh, you know once you get those results uh, but then you know use it uh, then I would use it to create you know higher order elements as well and so forth and uh, and then uh, you can begin testing against them like once you've you're fairly confident that the thing that you're doing is, is a valid representation. Then you can begin to ask questions against the simulated environments rather than, uh, you know, trying to isolate these elements and, and so forth from that. Um, and so, you know, then you can uh, kind of get an idea of how how it should behave and, and you have this additional set of rules or whatever. Um, and so if you can make it abstract enough to take in, you know, forms of energy that are already composed like that, and then you can, you know, start to use it uh, as this, uh, what will what would hopefully be some simplified model of, of these interactions and so forth, um, and, and so I, I think it would have applications in, in the world of chemistry. Um, and so uh, it would be interesting to carry that forward. Um, but anyway, so it's uh, <laughs> this is my presentation to you of a of a first step in in a direction of uh, you know some abstract problem like this. Uh, hopefully you've gotten something out of this and, and not just today's lecture but also you know the course this semester um, good luck with all of the rest of your exams have a great summer uh, and um, you know uh, feel free to reach out and I'd love to hear from you all all right uh, take care